Okay, my, it is my pleasure to introduce Duncan Watts. Duncan Watts has many accolades. Katie and I were just joking that he must be 150 years old for all the things that he's accomplished. But here's one fun fact that you might know about our interdisciplinary uh, Professor Watts, which is that voluntarily, he joined the Australian Navy right out of high school. And not only that, six years, spent six years in the Australian Navy. We cannot say that about many behavioral scientists. And that is vaguely related to his topic today, although he probably could have stumbled upon this topic in many other organizations that need improvement. Um, Duncan, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Angela, great to be here. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, well, so uh, I wanna to talk today about um, uh, how task complexity uh, affects what I'm going to call group synergy. And just a quick, very uh, quick background. Uh, as you probably know, uh, group problem solving is uh, a big uh, topic, both uh, in practice and also in theory. Uh, there is uh, an enormous literature on team performance and, and, and group uh, dynamics uh, across a, a wide uh, variety of disciplines going back many decades. Uh, and also uh, in the, the world of practice, uh, most uh, large companies and uh, I would say uh, increasingly scientific organizations and, uh, and, and government and non-governmental uh, organizations are increasingly concerned about uh, teams and how to put them together and how to make them uh, perform better and happier and, and, uh, and many other uh, outcome variables of interest. And so, Given uh, you know, how much uh, thought has been put into this problem over such a long period of time and how much it matters for uh, practical outcomes, uh, it is constantly surprising to me at least how many uh, basic questions are unanswered. And today I wanna focus on you know, what might be the most basic question of all, which is when should we even use groups anyway? Um, and so to make that question a little clearer, I wanna introduce a term called synergy. Uh, there's a, a, a very uh, interesting book by James Larson called In Search of Synergy in, in Small Group Performance that, that uh, inspired this, this terminology. And the question is, under what conditions do groups of people outperform individuals? And so uh, just to be a little bit more precise, I wanna contrast uh, what I'm gonna call interacting groups or just groups with nominal groups. And so an interacting group is exactly the thing you're thinking of. It's a group of people who are working together on a task and they're, they're interacting with each other in some way. It could be in person, it could be online. Uh, but the point is they're, <clears throat> they're, uh, they're sharing uh, information. Uh, they are uh, either encouraging or discouraging each other. They're, uh, they're working together to solve a problem. A nominal group uh, is not really a group at all. Uh, it's actually a, a collection of, uh, of individuals who are working on the problem independently, um, but it's the same number, right? So the, 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 uh, the reason for comparing interacting groups with nominal groups is to uh, make an apples to apples comparison so that the difference uh, is purely uh, uh, the, the attributable to the interactions rather than the, the number of people involved. Uh, and so, uh, so this uh, outperformance of an interacting group with respect to a nominal group is what Larson calls synergy and what I'll be calling synergy. Uh, and there are, there are two uh, types of synergy which refer to, or two sort of categories of synergy which refer to two um, comparisons that you might make between uh, an interacting group and a nominal group. Uh, the first one, uh, which Larson calls weak synergy, uh, is when the group outperforms an average member. So you take the nominal group, uh, and then you look for the average member of that nominal group and you ask, can, can my uh, actual group outperform that person? And that's uh, re referred to as weak synergy. So at least you're doing better than average. Uh, strong synergy is when the group outperforms uh, even the best member uh, of a nominal group. So you may have heard the expression wisdom of crowds uh, or uh, which comes up in prediction markets and other settings. That would be an example of strong synergy where um, uh, you know, even the uh, the best uh, performer is being outperformed uh, by the uh, by the group. Now, surprisingly, 
well, maybe this doesn't surprise you, but it surprised me that uh, if if the there's been a lot of, of research over the years that has made comparisons between interacting groups and nominal groups. And in general, uh, it, it tends to support weak synergy, but very rarely do they find that uh, that groups uh, outperform nominal groups in this best uh, person sense. So very little evidence for strong synergy. And so it's unclear uh, at the moment, at least, under what conditions we should expect to find uh, synergy. So the answer is that it could depend on many things. Uh, certainly, uh, group compositional factors could make a difference. Certain types of groups, certain combinations of people and features uh, might be expected to perform uh, better than others. And there's many different ways in which we could uh, in which we could uh, rate individual people and therefore many different ways in which we could combine them. We could have people with different skill or cognitive style or social perceptiveness or critical reflection. Uh, we could have uh, diverse or non-diverse groups. So there's all sorts of ways in which we might vary the composition of groups, which might affect the type of synergy that we could get. Uh, we could also vary uh, group process factors. Uh, we could introduce leaders or network structure or communication. Uh, there's also many ways, so, so, so factors that are uh, uh, separate from the uh, actual people who you put in the group, but nonetheless affect the way that they interact. We could clearly imagine how that might affect synergy. And finally, we might uh, imagine that, that, that synergy may or may not emerge uh, as a function of the task itself. And so within here, we have two uh, distinctions. One is, is on types of tasks, and there's been a lot of work uh, on, uh, on, on, on uh, taxonomies of tasks. And you might uh, expect that uh, some of them would more lend themselves to interacting groups than others. Uh, but the one that I want to focus on today is complexity. So what do I mean by that? Uh, at, a, at a very sort of rough qualitative level, it's fairly intuitive, uh, complexity. Uh, increases with the number of components that uh, uh, that make up a task. Uh, it increases with the number and strength of the interdependencies between these components. And it increases with the uh, time scale, or, or rather decreases with the time scale uh, on which uh, these interdependencies might change. So intuitively, if you take a task with more components and more interdependencies that has to be executed on shorter time scales, that's going to be harder or more complex than a task uh, which has fewer components or fewer interdependencies or for which you have lots of time. Uh, so it seems pretty, uh, so, so that seems uh, pretty plausible and, and intuitive that complexity should impact performance and could impact performance both for individuals and also for groups. Uh, it's also plausible that complexity could, uh, could impact group synergy. Right, that, that for some uh, types of tasks or more or less complex tasks may lend themselves more or less to interacting groups versus uh, independent individuals. But here the direction is less clear, right? So on the one hand, uh, as you have more complexity, you might think that, uh, that uh, you know, factors like uh, distributing effort or people checking each other's errors or, or reducing redundancies might help, in which case interacting groups might perform better vis-a-vis -vis nominal groups. Uh, but it also could get worse, right? That you might have you know, the, the kinds of process losses that we know arise in groups uh, such as um, uh, social loafing uh, or, um, or groupthink or, um, or, or conflict uh, may in fact get uh, more problematic uh, with uh, the complexity of the task. So it could go either way. Uh, so, okay, so that's what we're going to be uh, interested in here, but the, the, the big analytical problem associated with trying to study anything to do with task complexity is that once you go beyond the sort of very high level, vague, hand wavy, qualitative definition that I just gave, things get complicated pretty quickly. Uh, and so this is a, a figure from a 2012 paper, uh, which uh, said it you know, set out to, to really clarify the notion of, uh, of task complexity uh, and reviewed papers going back to the 1980s, like the one that I just cited before by Wood, uh, and discovered 24 distinct definitions of task complexity. 
uh, and in an attempt to sort of unify and, and clarify all of those different definitions, uh, they came up with their own model, uh, which as you can see, looks pretty complex. Uh, so there's uh, 27 complexity contributing factors grouped under five task components and 10 complexity dimensions. Uh, so, you know, actually trying to assign numbers to these different uh, components and, and then coming up with a, you know, an overall quantitative score for a task, you know, even just for one task would be, uh, you know, an extraordinary amount of effort and would involve lots of subjective judgments because a lot of these factors are, are not themselves very well defined, uh, especially in any kind of task independent way. Uh, and so the problem is that if you just take two arbitrary tasks and say, you know, how do I, uh, you know, which one is more complex than the other, it's totally unclear how to do that, right? So it's very difficult to, you know, imagine any uh, sort of study in which you're, you're asking this question about synergy as a function of complexity because complexity is itself uh, difficult to measure in a way that uh, is independent of the task. So the solution that we propose here is to really set all of that aside. We're not going to solve that problem of a, you know, a general purpose language for task complexity. That would be a, a, an amazing contribution to make, but uh, uh, that's something that's still in the too hard basket. Uh, instead, we're going to set that aside and, uh, and uh, instead identify a class of tasks for which we can vary complexity without changing anything else, okay? And so in this way, we can make the comparison that we want to make between more and less complex tasks. Uh, and we can do that quite systematically but we're not confounding that with anything else uh, that might change if we, for example, switch types of tasks. And in addition, because we want to do an experiment, uh, we, uh, we need to uh, have a task that satisfies some other, uh, or a class of tasks that satisfies some other criteria, namely that uh, we can actually perform it both in an interacting group setting and a nominal group setting. So it has to be something that individual problem solvers can do on their own, at least in principle. Uh, and in order to be able to perform it in a, in a lab setting, we'd like to be able to recruit unspecialized crowd workers with minimal training, okay? Um, so it can't be uh, something that requires a lot of, of highly specialized knowledge. Uh, and ideally we would like it to, to map to real world tasks. Okay, so the, the candidate uh, class uh, that we're going to study here is what's called constraint satisfaction and optimization problems. So this is a, uh, a class of problems that is uh, studied uh, in theoretical computer science uh, and also in operations research uh, in which we want to uh, optimally allocate some resource uh, subject to one or more constraints. So uh, you know, staffing a software project uh, is an example of a constraint satisfaction and optimization problem. You want to uh, put people together to optimize uh, the performance of the team, but some people may not get along or some people may have uh, uh, incompatible schedules. Uh, and so those are constraints that you have um, uh, in assigning your, your resource here, your people to the project. Forming learning groups is another example, railway timetabling, allocating vaccines, ventilators, and medical supplies during COVID uh, is another example of a constraint satisfaction and optimization problem. So, so there's sort of a natural um, uh, application of this you know, theoretical uh, type of or class of problems to the kinds of real world uh, resource allocation problems that, that we might actually care about. Uh, and fortunately, it turns out that it's very you know, relatively easy to tune these sorts of problems uh, with respect to complexity. Uh, and I'll, I'll be more concrete about that in a second, but very roughly you can, you can think of the payoff landscape uh, associated with a, a constraint satisfaction or, or CSOP problem as I'm gonna call them. Uh, so this is a, a picture over on the right hand, on, the picture on the right hand side here is a two dimensional problem where you have two parameters that you're varying and the vertical axis is the, the, the fitness or the payoff. And it, 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 uh, it forms what we would refer to as a rugged landscape. So a, a, a payoff function in which you have many 
uh, uh, optima or local optima, uh, and they are separated by suboptimal regions. So it's uh, non-trivial to search uh, this landscape. And that is, in a sense, is what makes it complex. Okay. Uh, so the specific example that we're going to talk about today uh, is uh, what we call a room assignment problem. So it's not all that important what the, the particulars of the problem are. Um, we just pick something that seemed uh, relatively intuitive, uh, but it has the, uh, the essential characteristics of a, of a CSOP problem. So here you have, uh, you're in a context of assigning students to rooms. You have some number of students and students you have M rooms, and in addition to that, you have Q constraints. So uh, this is a, an example in which you have six students and four rooms, and there's two constraints. One says B and E must be neighbors, and the other one says C and F can't live in the same room or be neighbors. So those are constraints. Uh, you also have a payoff uh, function or payoff table over on the left-hand side here, which tells you how much each student prefers each room. And so the idea is you want to assign the six students to the four rooms such that uh, you generate the highest level of satisfaction, the highest aggregate level of satisfaction, uh, while also uh, obeying the constraints. And you can either, uh, you know, you could, you could make the rule that uh, a solution can't be submitted unless the constraints have been obeyed, or you could uh, simply say uh, that there's some large penalty associated with violating a constraint. So either one of those would work. And uh, clearly, or at least uh, uh, it, it, hopefully it is clear that you can increase the complexity of this task uh, by increasing these three parameters. So just to give some examples, uh, this is a, a pretty easy one. The one that I just showed you uh, it doesn't actually take very long to do. And you can probably imagine doing this by yourself without too much trouble. Uh, this is a harder example. You now have, uh, what is that, nine students and six rooms and you have about eight or nine constraints. So that starts to seem like a more difficult problem. Maybe this would take you longer. Uh, you might have to sort of juggle things around and uh, you know, run into some problems and then back off again and then try some different solutions. Uh, and then finally, this is a pretty hard version of the problem uh, where we have, um, what is that? Uh, about 15 students and eight rooms and, and a whole bunch of constraints. So this is something that, you know, at least when I look at this problem, I think I'm not even sure I could, could solve that problem in the, in the required amount of time. Okay. So, uh, so we can definitely uh, vary these problems over quite a, uh, a, a wide range of complexity. Um, without changing anything else about the task. Uh, so that's you know, the main feature that we would like to have here. Uh, the way we're gonna run this experiment is in two, or well, the way we ran this experiment is actually in two phases because we want to uh, be able to compare groups with individuals and we wanna be able to construct uh, groups uh, in a specific way. Uh, we ran an initial phase in which we recruited 1200 participants uh, from Mechanical Turk uh, we gave them some training, we explained the problem to them, we had them do a couple of practice tasks so that they, they understood it. Uh, and then all of them completed five room assignment tasks of varying complexity. And, and, and actually we kept the complexity pretty low uh, in this first phase uh, because we, uh, we really wanted people to have uh, a positive experience so that they would come back for the second phase. Uh, so we had three very low complexity tasks and two moderate. Uh, and we use the moderate task to rate them on their individual skill level. We also had them do a separate task, uh, a reading the mind and the eyes task uh, to measure their social perceptiveness. So we have now, we have a measure of this social perceptiveness. Uh, we also have uh, a measure of their skill. So now in phase two, uh, which happened uh, several days later, we re-recruited uh, over 800 of the same participants and assign them uh, to one of six blocks. Uh, so you can see the blocks over on the right hand side. So we have a high skill, high social perceptiveness block, a, a mixed skill, high social perceptiveness block, and, and so on. Uh, so we first assign you to a, uh, to a block, uh, and then uh, we randomly assign you within that block either to be uh, in, a, in, a, in a group of, of three, an interacting group of three, 
or in an individual condition, and that's how we're going to create the nominal groups. So in the group condition, uh, it looks uh, uh, the the interface looks almost the same as what I just showed you. The the the, the examples that I showed you before were for individuals working on the task. So over on the right hand side, you see a screenshot of the group condition where uh, the player can see themselves in pink. Uh, and then they can see their two like, avatars for their for their two collaborators. Um, and they have a, a, a chat uh, window where they can talk to each other. Um, they also can see when uh, each uh, each of their uh, collaborators is, is moving one of the other individual. So the way you move individuals is you grab them with your mouse and you drag and drop them. And so if you move an individual that locks that individual for the other person. So uh, so other than that, everyone can do whatever they want, but they're clearly uh, able to see each other, they're able to communicate and they are uh, and they are interdependent uh, in this sense. Um, and then at the end of the, um, the other interdependency is that in order to submit the, uh, the solution, uh, all three of them have to agree. Okay. So now these uh, in this group condition, all participants completed uh, another five tasks, uh, and this time we made the uh, the range of tasks bigger. We went from very low, all the way up to very high complexity, which looks uh, a little bit like the one that I showed you at the end. Okay. So what do we find? Uh, just a quick sanity check or manipulation check. We can, we can uh, show that uh, as we vary task complexity, uh, we do in fact see uh, people respond in the way that we would expect. So there's a, 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 the, the normalized score, which is just the, the score divided by the maximum possible score uh, decreases quite substantially uh, over uh, as a function of task complexity by about 50% of its total possible to total um, uh, range. Uh, duration uh, increases a lot. So we go from roughly two minutes to complete an easy task to uh, six minutes to complete a very hard task. Uh, and then efficiency is just the, the, <clears throat> the ratio of score to duration. And you can see that that uh, is, is going down uh, quite a lot. So this is exactly what you would expect uh, for subjective complexity. Uh, and the, the fact that it varies so much is very, is very helpful to us. Um, so now what's the main question here? We're looking for uh, uh, both weak and strong synergy where we're gonna compare the group performance with just a randomly selected member of a nominal group. So that's the, the, the average uh, and strong synergy is where we, we wanna pick the best member of a nominal group. And that could be best with respect to uh, the quality of the solution or the speed of the solution or the efficiency. Okay, so we have four different notions now of nominal group, random, highest scoring individual, fastest individual, and most efficient individual. Okay. So what do we find? Uh, this is sort of the main figure and there's a lot on there. So I'll just spend a minute going through it. So the top, uh, uh, the top uh, panel shows standardized score. So this is uh, normalized uh, within uh, complexity category. So actually that dashed line there is, is not a great uh, visual aid there. We should not be comparing, uh, performance is getting worse as I just showed you uh, uh, for everybody going from, from very low to high, uh, to very high complexity. Uh, so the, the, the standardized score here uh, is uh, everything is demeaned and uh, expressed in uh, standard deviations. So really this is just uh, making it easier to see uh, the differences between uh, the different types of groups within each complexity level. Okay. So uh, you can see that uh, groups uh, outperform uh, random fastest and the most efficient nominal groups but they underperform the best nominal group, which is the, uh, which is the, <clears throat> the orange color across uh, all uh, 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 complexity uh, categories, right? So, so teams are doing, or interacting groups are doing pretty well, but they're not, uh, they're, they're definitely displaying weak synergy, but they're not displaying strong synergy with respect to solution quality. And we'll come back to that later. Um, in the, uh, the duration and efficiency, you see a different 
uh, pattern where uh, the, uh, the interacting groups are actually slower uh, than all types of uh, individuals or, or nominal groups for the low solution, the low complexity uh, categories, but they're faster for all for the, for the highest uh, complexity categories. So putting those two things together on the bottom panel, if we look for uh, uh, efficiency, um, <clears throat> we can see this very striking transition where uh, interacting groups go, go from being the least efficient for uh, easy tasks to the most efficient for hard tasks. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, just summarizing, going back to the sort of synergy uh, classification, we get uh, unconditional weak synergy for solution quality, and we get conditional strong synergy uh, for duration and efficiency. So let's try to unpack that a little more. Um, uh, because we have very uh, you know, granular timestamp data, we're able to uh, break up the total solution uh, period into four sub periods. So T1 is the, the, from the, the start time to when the group comes up with its first solution. T2 is, is, when they, is the time it takes to go from their first solution to the best solution. Uh, the, uh, they don't always submit the best solution. Uh, and sometimes they think about it for, you know, they don't necessarily know that it's the best solution that they're gonna get. And so there's some time after that where they continue fiddling around with it. Finally, they get their final solution, which is the last one that they choose. And then there's potentially some more time of messing around before they, they finally decide to, to hit the submit button. And so that's the, th the four time periods. Uh, and we can see that uh, I really just wanna, um, well, uh, T1, uh, T1, T3 and T4, there's not a lot of uh, interaction with complexity. Uh, in the, the, the T1 period, interestingly, interacting groups tend to start quicker. They tend to be quicker to get to their first solution than individuals. Uh, if you look at T3 and T4, they tend to be slower to go from their best solution to the final solution. And they're even slower uh, to submit, uh, to, to, to go from their final solution to actually submitting. So. So the, what we call you know, process losses associated with groups, the kind of the, the arguing, the, the indecision, all of these things that we associate with groups, those process losses are concentrated in T3 and T4 where individuals consistently do better. The big effect of uh, complexity happens in this, in this second period, which is really where all the, the thinking, I guess, uh, is, is done. Uh, and you can see here that, uh, that again, in the, for low complexity, uh, for low complexity tasks, the, the groups take longer than individuals. But for the high complexity tasks, they're actually they're actually doing better. So big interaction effect with complexity, uh, going from initial solution to best solution. So just adding all of that up, and I see I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to go very quickly. If we add all of that up, we can we can sum up the total benefits, which is uh, which accrue in T1 and T2, and the total costs, which accrue in T3 and T4. And then if we take the difference, we can see um, uh, this. Uh, well, we can we can plot the difference. Uh, uh, plot the, the 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 orange bar shows the total costs, and the the blue bar shows, shows the total benefit. And you can see very clearly that uh, that the synergy, the strong synergy, appears uh, at um, moderate complexity where total benefits cross over uh, with total costs. Uh, finally, we can also look uh, at a, a, in a little more detail at, at what groups are actually doing differently and why aren't they getting uh, better solutions. Uh, and this is something that is still a little mysterious because groups are doing a lot. They're, they're generating more solutions than nominal groups. They're generating them faster. And they're also exploring more. The, the radius uh, the, the, or the, 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 the radius or the, 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 the difference in the solution space is, is, uh, is greater for, for interacting groups than nominal groups. All of these seem like good things and reasons why you might expect uh, uh, interacting groups to outperform nominal groups, both with respect to, to speed and also score. Uh, but uh, interestingly, even after you correct uh, for the tendency of interacting groups to, uh, to submit uh, a, a solution that's worse than their, than their best solution, uh, 
uh, they still don't perform quite as well as uh, the best individuals. So this panel D over here, you can see that they're getting very close, uh, but the point estimate is still lower than best individual. So uh, some interesting results here, uh, interacting groups are uh, clearly doing something uh, quite different than, uh, than nominal groups, than individuals. Uh, they are showing evidence for strong synergy with respect to efficiency, and that could be something that you really care about in a, in a real world context um, where speed matters a lot and just getting something reasonable uh, is, is sufficient. Uh, but if you really, really care about getting the absolute best solution quality and you're not concerned about time, it's still the case that uh, individuals operating on their own, the best individuals operating on their own can do better. Uh, and so in future work, we, we wanna try to understand better how that's happening, uh, whether it replicates for other types of tasks. Uh, and finally, uh, we wanna come back to uh, a, a, another problem that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, looking at the composition uh, of teams and seeing uh, you know, uh, both within teams and also between teams and uh, nominal groups, uh, how composition matters. Okay, so I'm really out of time here. Uh, thanks for uh, staying with me as I uh, went through a lot of results there and uh, happy to take some questions. Thank you so much. Um, do you mind closing your slides, Duncan? That was great. And then we'll, we'll move to the Q&A and we have all sorts of wonderful questions. So I'll do my best to uh, pepper you with them. Um, actually, a lot of the questions are related in different ways to generalizability. So let me start there and see if you have some thoughts on a few of the kinds that are popping up. So one um, question we've seen from a couple of different people, Amit Kumar and Kendero both asked uh, about group size. And if you um, thought at all about that, how you sort of chose the sizes you worked with, if you've done any other studies with other sizes and have a sense of how the results depend on, on group size. Yeah, so we did not vary group size in this experiment um, for the obvious reason that you know, everything you vary just, you know, multiplies the dimensionality of your experiment and makes things more difficult to do. Um, and three is a nice number because it's, you know, the smallest number that's really a group. Um, uh, and, and that uh, is helpful for, um, you know, again, just sort of logistical, practical purposes. You want to have, a, you know, a large number of groups. And so um, the you know, cost of running an experiment increases linearly with the number of people in each group. Uh, we have done some previous work, I, and so the short answer is I think it will matter. And we have done some previous work. There's a paper with Andrew Mao and Sid Suri and Winter Mason back in 2017, uh, where we looked at um, uh, the effect of group size on performance uh, for uh, an even more complex task where we were we had a, a bunch of people doing a crisis mapping uh, 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 experiment um, uh, in the lab. And, and there we found that, uh, and again, we made a comparison between uh, interacting groups and, and nominal groups. And again, we found uh, that, uh, well, in that case, complexity was fixed because it was just one task, but, uh, but the uh, nominal groups uh, outperformed the interacting groups for small n, and the interacting groups uh, ended up doing better for for large for large n, sort of up, uh, roughly sort of 16 to 30 people. So we did see evidence that uh, that larger groups uh, are better at um, you know error checking and and uh, and eliminating redundancies, but you know that was for a different task. Um, you know, I think the generalization question is a really good one and should be asked about all studies of groups performing tasks uh, that we, we do not uh, have a, a, you know, like a comprehensive sense of how all of these things interact. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's always hard to pick your stimuli and know how they'll extra extend. Um, okay, let me go to a simpler question from um, Nicole. I think it's I, IB's first. Uh, I'm sorry if I but butchered the pronunciation. She's wondering if you found any results or interactions with the social sensitivity RME measure. Yeah, so this is in, uh, you know, another, I didn't have time to add these results into the presentation today, but uh, it turns out that the, um, 
that the, the social perceptive measure does uh, have a significant uh, effect on group performance, uh, but it's not as important uh, as skill. So, uh, so average skill is the, is the dominant um, predictor of group performance. And if you're doing prediction, so it's one of these interesting sort of statistical results where if you just separately measure the, um, the, you know, the, the size and, and significance of the coefficients, you'll see both skill and, uh, and social perceptiveness are, are large and positive and highly significant. Um, but it turns out when you're predicting performance in an out of sample sense, really the only thing that matters is average skill. Um, the social perceptiveness contributes a tiny little bit, but um, but not all that much. Uh, but yes, it 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 does uh, affect things, and uh, and we actually see that in the feedback that we get from the participants, where uh, where we put a, a low social perceptiveness person with high social perceptiveness people, they 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 actually complain about them. Uh, so it's really picking up something uh, uh, very relevant to this to this problem solving task. It's really interesting. Um, okay, clarification question from Martina Hoopner. Um, Martina wants to know if groups were were rewarded for finishing before time. I guess related to your efficiency um, results. Not uh, not directly. No, they had a ten minute time limit, um, and almost no one took the whole time. Uh, so uh, I think the the reward is really um, in terms of their outside options that, you know, these people are Turkers, they're there to make money. Uh, and the faster they get through uh, a task, the sooner they can go on and do other things. So I think they're, you know, they're, they're generally motivated uh, to do things quickly. Um, and, you know, I think in many cases, willing to um, submit uh, a solution that they know is not the optimal solution if as long as it's pretty close um, because they don't want to waste time. So definitely a trade-off in their minds uh, between getting the best possible score and, uh, and doing it as quickly as possible. That makes sense. Um, okay, there have been a number of questions related. I mentioned generalizability at the beginning. Some people were asking about group size, but a lot of people are asking about problem type. And I know you touched on that a little bit, but is there anything you can say about, um, you know, some of the kinds of questions people are asking is whether it's open-ended, has a clear solution, whether it's divisible easily. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of how those things can matter to these kinds of study results? I don't. I don't think anybody does. Um, I think that's a great uh, challenge problem. And that's something that we're working on right now, where we're basically going to take this design and do it for lots and lots of tasks um, of different types. Um, but it is, it is a big challenge because, you know, even though there are, uh, there are task taxonomies out there in the literature, I'm, it's, not such an easy exercise to take some arbitrary task and locate it in the space of task features and then doing that for many tasks and then systematically sampling from that space and so on and so on. So yes, great question. Surprised it hasn't come up in the last 60 years um, because it's such an obvious question. Um, and uh, I think it's, that's exactly what we're gonna, we're gonna try to do. All right, well, you may have a similar answer to this one, but I'll ask it anyway, in case it, you know, leads lead somewhere interesting. Um, Jennifer Jonas is curious about team relationships and whether or not teams have worked together before, uh, if there's improvement over time, and if there's anything you can say about that. Uh, we, we do not, other than, uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'd have to check, but I, I don't think we see any, um, any uh, um, significant changes over the course of the experiment. So if you think, you know, you basically you've got a team that's working together five times in a row, you might think that by the time they get to the last task, they're better at it than they were the first task. I don't think we, we see any evidence for that. Um, and maybe that's just because it's not long enough. Um, other than that, we don't have them, you know, coming back over and over again uh, to, to work together. 
Um, I know that there is um, some other uh, clever work um, by uh, my postdoc, Mark Whiting, and his former uh, advisor, um, um, Michael Bernstein at Stanford, uh, where they uh, have this very clever way of masking uh, um, identities online. So they create groups and then they, they reconstitute the same group over and over again. And you keep the same identity the whole time, but what you see, uh, the other identities get switched. So you, can, so you think you're with a different group every time, but you're actually with the same group every time. Um, and it turns out that, um, that that has some interesting consequences. So for certain types of tasks, if you have a bad experience with, uh, uh, with your group and you have a bad outcome, then, uh, then if, you, if you get matched with, if you think that you're with the same group again, then things continue to go badly. And if you think that you're with a different group, but you're actually with the same group, it's sort of like the slate gets wiped clean and you can, it turns out you can, you can do, um, uh, you can do well, even though the last time you did badly. Um, but for other types of tasks, that doesn't happen. So for some types of tasks, if the group doesn't work well together, it will always not work well together. And for, and for, and for other types of tasks, there's this sort of historical dependency. There's this memory effect where you could actually do pretty well, but because you remember having a bad experience, things don't, things don't go well. So, so there has been some work on, on repeated group interactions um, and that's like the best that I know of, um, but we, we didn't do that here other than, you know, of I course, the, like within the fresh start benefits and, um, yeah. in, the, in the domain of tasks as well. Um, this is fascinating. As you could tell, we, we had many more questions than we could get to, and we'll be sure to share those with you afterwards, but thank you so much for being our speaker. This was wonderful. Um, oh, and Angela's going to come back and, and preview next week. Okay, wait, I closed the document. Can oh, you nope, preview next week? Preview I just came week. back to wave at Duncan and say, that was fascinating. And I love your creative mind. Yeah. But I closed oh, the document okay. that had the name on the next week. <laughs> next week is John Bashir, And he's going to be speaking. Oh, yeah. Harvard University economist, one of my um, favorite humans and collaborators, brilliant economist. Um, who's going to be talking about consumption responses to mortgage payments, uh, evidence and implications. So if you like mental accounting or care about savings decisions, you will love. Or if you week. have a mortgage. Or if you have a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> or if you ever might want to have a mortgage or know anyone who has a mortgage, come next week. It'll be great. And actually, special announcement about next week is that um, because he's presenting fresh sort of hot, hot data, he won't be allowing us to record it. So it won't be posted afterwards. So Whoa. you can only see it live. Don't miss that. Uh, okay. So we'll see lots of you next week and we'll have a hokey joke for you if you're early. We're on time. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Thank you, Duncan. This is so great. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Angela. Great to see you. Great Let's to talk see you soon. soon. Okay, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you all for coming.